While we have several of our own out today, we have a number of visitors with us, and we're very grateful for your presence. Always reminded of what an older gentleman told me years ago in my first full-time work. When he would meet somebody, he would say, Now we'll treat you so many ways, you will have to like one of them. Have you ever done any studying in your Bible very much at all about Joseph? Not the Joseph of the Old Testament, but the uh, Joseph who was the legal, I say legal, father of Jesus Christ. I dare say that if you have, one thing stands out. You don't find a thing about anything he said. It's just not there. One preacher said, even Balaam's donkey said more than Joseph did. But we shouldn't think that there's not a lot to be learned about this man's faith. We can easily say that faith, the noun form of belief, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. We can define faith to be one's trust in God and godly things, one's confidence in God and Christ and the gospel system to save him. We can understand that one's confidence or faith or belief in the Christ and the gospel is not correct if he doesn't have the proper knowledge of the Bible, seeing that faith comes by hearing the word of God. And you must be able to rightly divide or handle aright the word of truth to be sure your knowledge of God's will for you is correct. And we know that's important because Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, if ye continue in my words. And if you are a person who will do God's will, verse 32 says it all. You shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. But if you don't know the Bible correctly, then you won't know the truth. Your faith or confidence in God can't be right. So we need to know the importance of Bible study. But when it comes right down to looking at Joseph, you see a man of great confidence in God. Great trust in God. And you can see it by his actions and what the Bible reveals that he thought about things. We recognize that James teaches that it's more than mentally assenting to the fact of a matter. That is, the faith that saves is. That the faith or the belief that saves one is an active, obedient faith. Just read James 2 and you'll see faith apart from works is dead being alone. And we know the proper response to God's will regarding our obligations or His commandments is that if we love Him, we will keep His commandments. All of this you see in Joseph in the relatively small amount of information that's in the Bible about him. I want to emphasize in looking at the life of Joseph that God is emphasizing through the whole Bible that you can trust Him. A lot of things you can't trust. People can love you as humans as much as they could love anybody, but they can't control things. And they're fickle. Things we plan to do and promise to do, uh, many times though we fully intend to do it, we're not able to. Circumstances may intervene. You don't have to worry about that with God. And in the life of Joseph, uh, we will see that he lets us know that God can be trusted. Let's emphasize also that as you look through the Bible at the great men and women God has selected for us to follow in their steps and faithful trusting service to him, that a person God calls a great person now again, this is in God's eyes. We're not caring what men think who are not interested in what the Bible teaches. But from God's viewpoint, a great person is someone who trusts Him 
every day, all day long, on the basis of what he's taught in the Bible. And thus God can be trusted. God keeps his promises. There's not a promise that God will make to us that he will not keep, or he has not already kept, or he is keeping. The first point I want to make about Joseph, and you might be turning to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, and in chapters 1 and 2, we'll find the other scriptures we shall note, Matthew 1, 18 through 25. When I, and this is our first point, when I am in doubt, when anyone's in doubt, then trust God's promises. When I'm in doubt, I must trust God's promise. This is characteristic of all the men God calls great in the Bible that he has revealed to us that we should follow them in their faithful service to God. Now let's go back over to Matthew 1, 18 through 25, and let's just read it for a moment. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be, let me pause here and say, notice that word. All this was done that it might be fulfilled. When you're reading through Matthew, you will find over and over again he shows the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies concerning the Christ. It is thought, and I think correctly so, that Matthew, of course an apostle of Christ, and a Jew, was one who wrote to convince the Jews that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so he, of course, would go to the Old Testament and the prophecies of the Messiah and show their fulfillment in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And you notice then he emphasizes that point. But let me add this to the word fulfilled. I said already that God keeps His promises. That word fulfill means God's keeping His promises. When He prophesied certain things, uh, the Jewish Messiah, the Savior to come, He made a lot of promises. A lot of promises in the Old Testament concerning Israel, different people in Israel, the house of David and so forth. And He keeps every one of them and He kept every one of them. And everything that He said in the Old Testament concerning the coming Jewish Messiah, and of course as we know, the Savior of the whole world, Jesus Christ, then when He says it's fulfilled, now you keep this in mind when you're reading through Matthew, any place, but especially Matthew, because He uses that word I've forgotten how many times. Especially important to the Jew who knew the Old Testament Scriptures was God's will and and though they had some confused ideas about themselves and didn't understand everything about the Messiah, His kingdom, the nature of the law of Moses, and the children of Israel, it was applied to them. Uh, they were very familiar with what it said. And thus, He's saying, now this was done, that God might keep His promise. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken, and what was spoken, a promise, of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now, of course, that harkens back to Isaiah 7, 14, where the great messianic prophet, as he's called Isaiah, some 750 years before Jesus walked this earth, prophesied that he would be born of a virgin. 
It's interesting as we throw this in parenthetically that when some want to challenge the Hebrew word Alma and try to say it doesn't just refer to a virgin woman who's never been married. It can for otherwise. Well, listen. When you come over in the Greek and the New Testament and the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew to quote Isaiah 7.14, the Greek word he uses here can't be applied to anything but a virgin. And thus you have a divine inspired commentary on Alma. The Hebrew word for virgin in Isaiah 7.14. Because it could be used for an unmarried woman who's never been married. And here, this clearly says it was. Because the Greek word for virgin means just that and nothing else. Now that tells us something about our own learning how to study the Bible. Wherever that you have an inspired divine commentary on the meaning of the passage, it can't be wrong, folks. Because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Continuing with our study of Joseph, and we also, by the way, from this can understand how the Jews understood that word Alma by this statement. Now, verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Now I said that from God's viewpoint, every great person, as the Bible defines greatness, and that's, that's how we should look at who's great, is that the Bible defines greatness. Or who is a hero, if you want to use that terminology. It's when someone trusts God all day long every day. So why, when I am in doubt, why should I cease to trust God? That's when I need to trust Him more than ever. And when I'm in doubt, does that change what the Bible says? Why no. When I'm feeling bad, does that change the meaning of the words of the Bible? When I'm a male, or if it's a female, or a old person or a young person or a rich person or a poor person sick person or a well person does it change the words of the Bible or their mean? No. When I'm feeling like I could wrestle a mad alligator and win in about two minutes you know, the Bible reads the same way. When I tried it and I'm running for my life it still reads the same way. <laughs> doesn't change. That's the nature, listen, of objective truth. It's just what it is no matter what we think of it or what we are or what we're not or how we deal with it. It's still what it is. We need to understand that. Now, how does that have a bearing on Joseph? Well, I said when, I, when I'm in doubt that I should uh, trust God. But let's look at this situation. Now we learn much about the upbringing of Joseph and Mary here and know that they were well schooled in the knowledge of God and the importance of abiding by it and not deviating from it. it says something about their parents. But now we're focusing on Joseph and they were simply going through what all the Jews did regarding marriage. And there were three steps. There, there was the engagement. Now, that wasn't where you found a girl and you liked her and you dated her and she wanted to date you and, and finally you decided to pop the question and, you yes, you're both going to be married and you set the date out there somewhere in the future. And no, that's not the way it worked. Mom and Daddy selected who you're going to marry. And if Mom and Daddy had a little girl saw a young person over there and watched him and saw him grow up, knew his family, how they lived, they could easily sit down and it was customarily done and nobody thought anything, any, anything at all about it. We would like our son to marry that girl. Well, guess what? On the other side of the fence, you would have the, the girl's parents and then, the, as I said, the parents of the boy, and they're all deciding. They meet and decide. Brethren, that's still done a lot in the Middle East. A lot. I talked and visited with those they wouldn't think any other way. 
of having a marriage other than that. It's interesting to talk to them. It's just their way of doing things. Maybe it's uh, the idea that parents who've been here a long time and struggled through marriage and have lived according to the Lord's will and let the Lord's will guide them and they've solved their problems in the light of God's truth is maybe they think they might have a little wisdom as to after proper research is done and study about somebody else as to who somebody should marry. Well, whether you like it or not, this is the way it was and still is in some places, as I said. So notice as he goes to the birth of Jesus in verse 18, it says, When as his mother Mary was a spouse. Well, you had the engagement all brought about because both mamas and daddies decided we would like our little girl and little boy to be married. That's what that was. But then there comes later on the betrothal. Now, we don't have anything quite like this today. Because when the betrothal came along, except for living together, they were married. That's just exactly what it was. They just hadn't moved in together. There was no sexual relations. They were not keeping house together. But as far as they were concerned, she's for me and I'm for her. And nobody else to be involved. That's the second step. That's where they are at this time. That's why it says that when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Of course, the next thing is what they will call the marriage. Remember you have the marriage feast? That's when, from that point forward, they moved in together and lived as we think of marriage today. Well, I can't say that much. I don't want people to think of marriage today all the way around. But as the Bible teaches about marriage. Now, those are the three approaches to being in a marriage that the Jews did. And everyone of them did it. And that's what they're doing. They're thinking nothing about it. They just want to be with one another and be husband and wife and live as they ought to live. How many others who were faithful to the law of Moses would have done the same thing? But at this time, all of a sudden, he finds out that she's expecting. Now that'd be bad enough today, even in the looseness and immorality that's out there. But in those days, it was really something else. I think some of us who lived 40 or 50 years ago and knew how marriage was looked at then probably appreciate more the way it was at this time than some people today in the way people treat marriage. But be that as it may, notice what goes on. Now, I said we don't have any words from him, but the Holy Spirit recorded his thoughts, and he was no dummy, and he was a serious-minded person. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. Folks, you realize what that says about that man? Because they're not old people, as we say. These are relatively young people. But he's already a just person. Does that tell you how he's been raised and what he's studied and how he believes himself? He is looking at things in the light of the law of Moses. And his concern still is for her. After all, you get the idea he does love her. So he's a just man. And because he's a just man, he's not willing to make her a public example. Thus he was minded to put her away privily. Now... What could happen in those days, because he had about three options. And we've already pointed out that betrothal is where Joseph and Mary are. He could, uh, the situation they could be in was everybody will think I've had relations with her and, and that's a mess. Or people could uh, think that she has uh, had relations with somebody else other than me, and any way you go, that's a miss. Or maybe she was actually raped, and that's no good either. So what's he going to do? You think any doubts ever crossed his mind? What did I say a while ago? We trust God even when doubts arise. Now remember, God is infinite wisdom. He says, these two young Jews, man and woman, are going to be husband and wife. They are the ones I'm going to entrust to rear Jesus. And he's got to never sin. 
Thus, I'm putting them in the care, putting him in the care of Mary and Joseph to rear him in such a way as that before he is old enough to control himself, they will see that he keeps the law perfectly. You ever thought about that? That's an obligation and a half. But God says he's the caliber of people that will do it. So he uh, is a thinking person, and he, he's wondering just what will happen. Well, what option does he choose? Well, we've read it, haven't we? He's a merciful person. He's going to put her away privately. He's not going to ruin her life. See, he has the power over her to ruin her life. Completely ruin her life if he wants to broad this, cast this out everywhere. In our day and time, while such a betrayal of my trust in you, well, what's all this mean? I, I know when a, when a person's out of wedlock gets married, what's happened? And we've been promised one another since we were children, and we've been keeping ourselves one another in the betrothal, and now this turns out like it does. But he's told that the Holy Spirit has brought about this pregnancy. And we think, well, that, that ends it. That's no problem. Listen, he has to live what he's about to do, Holy Spirit and no other Holy Spirit pregnancy, all the rest of his life. And what are people going to say about him? You don't think that doesn't impact people as to what people think about you and say about you? Well, it's caused all sorts of changes of mind and people who are decent people to turn out to be rotten as dirt because of what they think people say about them and what they actually do say about them. And listen, they're going to have to live with this the rest of their life and people are going to know what went on. I've seen people quit serving God over such matters as this. It's not nearly so important. It's because when they doubted, they lost their faith. They lost their trust in God. Some reason what they had believed the Bible taught before that, now it didn't teach it anymore. And thus they're really saying, God, you're not true to your promises. Even though I can read in the Bible and understand the words, and I did believe it, I don't. And do you ever get the idea that he's saying, I just want to get married. Why me? Why do I have to go through all of this? Rather than think, God selected me. He must see something in me maybe I don't even see yet in myself. And that was a compliment, you know, but it could be taken completely the other direction. And he shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now that within itself would bowl you over in the midst of all this other stuff and the doubts and what's going to happen. We think sometimes these people just weren't like us. God waved his magic wand and they just walked right through things and break us all to pieces. They never had a problem like we do. That's because we don't think like Joseph thinks and thought when we're reading these things. Now notice that all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord by the prophet. Verse 25 is an interesting verse when it comes to Joseph because he resolves to take the word of God to go by, regardless of what people might say, what they might not say, how they might treat them, knowing this will be with them the rest of their life, how long it's going to be. But notice, notice his resolve. And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. Now, folks, when people get married and they've been virgins, they're looking forward to the sexual act. Period. There's nothing wrong with that. These are young people with the same appetites as everybody else. And you know they've never, never, never had a sexual relation with anybody. Now what does he do? He marries her. But they have no sexual relations. What does that tell you about him in believing what's going on with Mary and that she must remain a virgin until this son is born? What does it tell you about his self-control? The gratification of his own desires, which he had a right to. He's married, isn't he? But he doesn't. We begin to learn a lot about Joseph, even though he doesn't have a word that he ever said recorded in the Bible. And that's what he did. Now, that's the first point when in doubt I should trust in God's promises and you may get more even out of what we've read so far regarding his confidence and trust in the promises of God than uh, what I've even said. But that'll serve to point out what I wanted to as our first point. And the second point is, 
For every problem you have, God has the solution. God never did say, you obey the gospel and become one of my children and you'll never have another problem. In fact, he teaches right the opposite. When you choose to live strictly and according out of love for me and my word, according to the truth of the New Testament, he tells us over and over again, you will have problems. But the Bible solves those problems, and that tests our faith in God. You're never going to have a problem that God can't solve. Of course, it takes your cooperation, doesn't it? Just like it took Joseph's cooperation. Just like it took Joseph's cooperation. Well, I want you to go with me then over to Matthew 2. And let's look at verse 13. Verse 13, chapter 2. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord, that's the wise men leaving, not going back by Herod to tell where they found the child. This is some time later, two years later, folks. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Now just stop right there. Let's think about this for a minute. He already knows that two years ago that Mary became an expectant mother by the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. He knows all of that. He knows all the Old Testament. He knows the miracles that were done by the prophets and other things God did that were miraculous. Why couldn't he just work the miracle here? <laughs> He's got a wife and a two-year-old baby. And he says, take off down to Egypt. And you'll do it on your own, by your own power. No promise of a miracle at all here. Why couldn't he begin to scratch his head and say, I don't know why I've got to do all of this. This is a two-year-old baby. And you know, he didn't go get on the airplane or get in a nice air-conditioned car. And look where he's got to go to and through what he's got to go with. And the area he must travel through. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the frontier days of America, say, in about 1840, 50, 60, 70. And who would think about starting out from the east in a covered wagon with a two-year-old and oxen and whatever you carry to head off out, let's say, to California? Well, they did, which shows you also people will do it for a lot less reason than such as Joseph and Mary are dealing with. But, but he goes ahead. He's got a problem. He's got to do this. And you know, the Lord tells him specifically what to do, but it's in generality, so it leaves him up to, do, up, up to his own planning to do it. But notice, arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. This is not a planned will plan for the next month to go. The word flee means get up and get out now. Well, notice verse 14. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. Now, we think sometimes it takes a, a month to pack to get ready to take one baby somewhere in our day and age. Uh, let's see. Did they have the diapers? Did they have the formula? Yeah, Mary was there. Did they have the baby food? What about food for themselves? How do they travel? Any of that in that day and age was not an easy thing to do. But they did according to the direction of God through the angel and made that couple hundred there about mile trip. Now how would you like to start off with Mary on a donkey holding the baby, maybe that's what it was, and you're leading it. And you're going from here to Dallas in a hurry. We don't think, do we? But they did. No question about it. God had the solution. And in a worst case scenario, you know what you need to do? You trust God on the basis of His Word. For faith comes by hearing the Word of God. You don't start saying, why me, this, that, and the other. If you read your Bible, you'll see folks have faced a whole lot worse than what most any of us have ever faced. And they're selected by the Holy Spirit as your example as to how you're to serve God. 
And remember, a great person in God's sight is one that serves him faithfully all day long, every day. Wherever he is, or she is, whatever she does. So leave immediately. He could have made it much easier, that is God, but he didn't. And they've got to make this journey. Now that's the second point. My third point is this. And it ties in with the others. It naturally flows from the others. When you're in trouble, you can trust God's solution. Think of the trust Joseph as the head of his family. The trust in God that he had to display. The faith in God. The belief in God. The determination to obey God no matter what he asked me. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Command and I'll obey. That's all that I need to have in my mind. And you know I'll get through life exactly as I ought to. When in trouble, we can trust God's solution. Look in verse 19 of Acts 2. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee, and, it, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled. God keeps his promises. Which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now think about this for a minute. He is a son of David. So is Mary. He already knows about the Old Testament prophecies where the Messiah is coming from. He understands all of that. He's now been involved in all these things. He's always done what God said to do. But why Nazareth? Bethlehem is the city of David. The kings all come out of Jerusalem. Bethlehem is just a few miles from Jerusalem. Why do you pick Nazareth? Do you remember that somebody down the line when the apostles were being chosen and they said to one of them, we have found Jesus of Nazareth? And the response was, it's like at Nazareth. Can anything good come out of cut and shoot? That's, that's what it amounts to. And you people are not from around here, you'd have to understand. You have some place like that where you're from. <laughs> That nobody thinks much good comes out of it. Uh, in Texas, can anything come good come out of Oklahoma or Arkansas? Well, you'll have to judge that by me. But <laughs> anyway, that's the way people think. They're, they're no different then than we are, though they're in different technology, language, and all that. They still think the same way. Places have reputations. Uh, he's sort of saying, let's go to a place where nobody will expect us. Because he's already afraid because Archelaus is running in his father's stead. So he doesn't go to Jerusalem. He doesn't go to Bethlehem, the city of David. He goes 55 miles north of Jerusalem to Nazareth. Well, there's a big reason for that. And all I said is not the reason. I just read it to you in verse 23. That it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the prophet. He shall be called a Nazarene. There's the real reason. Now you know what that tells me? You can make all the plans you want to make. If you're going to be faithful to God like Joseph, God's going to mess up your plans. Now, he intended to go back to Bethlehem. He intended to go back to that area. That was his plan. If you're going to serve God from the inside out and all over all the time, you better prepare for your little plans for yourself to get messed up. A lot of people are prepared for that. I've seen people all my preaching days, and that's going on close to 50 years now. Every congregation I've been in, they're faithful, they're there all the time, they give, they do the work, but out there somewhere they've got a plan. That's what they work for all their life. And all of a sudden it gets messed up. 
Somebody gets a disease they didn't count on. They thought they would get sick and die till they were 93. And they get very bad off at 40 or 50. Messes up the whole plan. People, have you ever noticed how we, we're, we're kind of silly people as a human race. We start at 20, 30, and into our 40s planning what we're going to do at 65 and 70 as if we're still going to be 25, 30, and 40 at 65 and 70. And so many times it just gets messed up. In this case, He's doing what he can, but he has enough sense to know when to be afraid, and he has to completely set his plans aside and go up here to a place that had a bad reputation. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I've seen people plan all around their children. And lo and behold, they remembered that they were free moral agents, so they could be trained and taught right and a godly example set before them, and they still turn out to be rotten to the core. Or they're good people... They just go ahead and do what they want to, just like you did when they get old enough to get out from under your jurisdiction. And so it goes. Or you have this great thing planned about your job, and then all of a sudden the company sells out to somebody else, and you're out there looking for a job. And we will. Not Joseph. He has an intelligent fear of what might be. He's already gone through all this education God's given him concerning what was going to happen and what Herod had done to the children of Bethlehem to try to kill this young child. He now knows we're in a very unique, special position, and God expects me to take care of this family, and God expects me to take care of this child. He is the one who will save Israel from their sins. And so he goes to a place where he thinks he can best do that, to escape what could very well happen to him. Interesting, God left that up to him, didn't he? He could have intervened here, but he didn't. But in order to keep his promises, he messed up the plans of Joseph. And it all ends, very plainly, with him coming back at God's command out of Egypt into Israel, saying that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Brethren, listen. What you need to do and I need to do is trust God like Joseph did on the basis of his commandments. Now, God was still speaking to folks then by angels and others, and so he went as God directed him. But he, his faith, his confidence was still based on the Word of God to do what he did when he did it. But you'll see in all cases he still was allowed to make certain choices in the area of what's good, better, best in discharging the obligation. And we're not prepared for that sometimes. We get our minds so set, we just can't believe this happened to us. Well, do you know what you can do tomorrow any more than anybody else does? Or what you will be ten years from now? Look, when you chose to believe on the basis of the Word of God that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that He is the way, the truth, of the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by Him, John 14, 6, when you chose out of great confidence in His Word to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's power to save, Romans 1.16, you're saying, I trust you with all that I am on the basis of your Word. How do you know He even remitted one sin when you were baptized for the remission of sin? You know it because this Bible is the Word of God and He said that He would forgive you when you're baptized for the remission of sins, all other things being scripturally equal. And thus, when we go through life, having chosen to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, prepare for some messed up plans that God can do with you what he intends to, to the furtherance of his kingdom and your own personal strength to serve him. Thus, whatever happens, if you're determined to obey him at all costs, when the plans are messed up, keep on keeping on. And now this most commonly quoted scripture for us, I think, becomes even more important. Be you steadfast unmovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, here's what Joseph knew. And we need to know it for as much as you know. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So what can we learn? Things will not always go according to our plans, but it doesn't change God's word. When God messes up your plan, it's because he has a better plan. He knows how to get you from earth to heaven. Me too. But we don't, independent of the truth revealed in the scriptures. Now think of the people today. Think of them who say, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. And yet they won't trust His plan. God has a plan of salvation. It's the way you can be saved from your sins. And it may be that you've cast your lot some direction or you've got this in your background or this in your family or whatever. And when you learn about God's plan, it really messes up your plan. <laughs> well, what are you going to trust in? The way that seemeth right to you, the end thereof, or the ways of death? Or are you going to take God as His Word and throw your lot with God based upon His promises? Because on the day that we lay down to die, and die faithful, however that death comes. Or, if we're alive, the Lord comes back first. When that takes place, and we've been faithful to Him according to the Word of God, and living a righteous life, it can be said of every one of us that the Scripture might be fulfilled, that has been promised to us. Well done. Our good, faithful servant. Enter ye in to the joy of thy Lord. So when we walk into heaven, that first part of however it's measured, the eternal day, it can be said on, by every one of us, it's been fulfilled. God kept His promises. I ceded to His plans on earth when I had plans, but His promises and His will messed them up. But He gave me a better plan for the one He messed up. So be thou faithful unto death and see what all in a man like Joseph is taught us that can help us be where he is in the, in the after a while. If you're subject to his call, we've studied the plan of salvation. If as a child of God your faith's wavered, you've sinned and your life has brought your sinful life, reproach on the church, or if it's a private sin, you still need to repent. You need to confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. Will you come to Jesus? as we stand and sing.